Is there a mood that expresses the human condition more than any other? For Soren Kierkegaard, that mood is indeed anxiety. And anxiety, otherwise known as angst, or angst, or l'angoisse in French, is a cornerstone of existential philosophy because existential philosophers, starting with Kierkegaard, really think of it as indicative of the very human condition. Not exactly a cheery philosophy, as you uh, may not be surprised to find out. In any case, or perhaps cheery, but in a surprising way, in a way that is recognizing the anguish or anxiety that is fundamentally characteristic of human existence. I'm Professor Ellie Anderson, a philosopher and co-host of Overthink Podcast. I'm using today the Essential Kierkegaard, which is the text that I assign in my existentialism class. And if you notice any similarities, like maybe uncanny similarities, to uh, Heidegger's view of anxiety, Sartre's view of anxiety, and Camus' notion of the absurd, that is because all of them were so deeply inspired by Kierkegaard, we could say that they cribbed him. For Kierkegaard, and um, specifically his pseudonym, Vigilius Haufniensis, because Kierkegaard writes in pseudonyms. He has these different characters who represent different uh, stages on life's way or different spheres of existence. And um, the text, The Concept of Anxiety, which is a book where he develops this notion of anxiety, is written by the pseudonym called Vigilius Haufniensis. Anxiety begins with a recognition that there is nothing that anxiety is about. What distinguishes anxiety from fear for Hafniensis is that there is an aboutness to fear. There is an object of fear. But the same is not true of anxiety. I am actually not anxious about finishing my philosophy paper. I am anxious about nothing. <laughs> and we'll say more about what that means momentarily. I'm going to switch to using the word Kierkegaard just for utility's sake. Uh, we could have conversations about what the author function involves in Kierkegaard's work. And I know some scholars of Kierkegaard are really careful about wanting to just talk about a particular pseudonym rather than Kierkegaard. Um, sorry if that is you. I am going to just use Kierkegaard here. But keep in mind to take that with a grain of salt because this is specifically his pseudonym, Vigilius Haufniensis, articulating that in this book. So. Kierkegaard describes anxiety starting with the idea that it's nothing. This common turn of phrase, he thinks, has a deeper philosophical resonance because he thinks that anxiety is nothing in a literal sense. When something feels out of joint, out of sorts, that is indicative of anxiety. And so anxiety isn't just a single feeling or a mood among others. It's actually what Heidegger will call in the following century a fundamental mood. For Kierkegaard, anxiety is this fundamental mood that, strictly speaking, is about nothing. Again, this is what distinguishes it from fear. And on page 153, Kierkegaard says that anxiety is freedom's possibility. When I think about possibilities, I'm usually thinking about a fixed set of possibilities. The possibility of going to the grocery store tonight, watching a TV show tonight, hanging out with a friend tonight. That is only part of the story of possibility, though. Even though it's the, our everyday notion of possibility, possibility truly understood, according to Kierkegaard, is on what we might call a meta level of possibility. The fact that it is possible for me to do anything at all, the fact that it is possible for me to choose between that delimited set of options, the fact that I am free with respect to them is, properly speaking, possibility. And anxiety emerges once I get the feeling of that possibility, the feeling of freedom. In a way, anxiety is the feeling of freedom, or we could say it's the beginning of the feeling of freedom. I'm going to look here at page 140, where Kierkegaard says, about five lines up from the bottom of the page, how does spirit relate itself to itself and to its conditionality? It relates itself as anxiety. So anxiety is the way that spirit relates itself to itself. And he con 
contrasts this with the vegetative. So I began the video by saying that anxiety is properly speaking human for Kierkegaard. It's fundamental to the human condition. Um, he thinks that only spiritual beings have a sense of their own freedom. So only they have anxiety. So sorry, plants back here, you don't get to have anxiety according to Kierkegaard. Or perhaps they're lucky not to have anxiety. One of the first things to note here is that anxiety for Kierkegaard thus is a marker of the spiritual condition. And he actually says that the more profound the anxiety, the greater the person. So already there is this valorization of anxiety, this idea that when you feel anxious, you are hitting on something. You are hitting on the absurdity of human existence and the fact that you are free to transcend the conditions in which you find yourselves, um, the immediate environment that surrounds you, and to make decisions. But of course, it's not as if anxiety is all that fun. And so the point is not to feel anxious all the time. The point for Kierkegaard is to take the lessons of anxiety and to use them for the purposes of living better. Let's think here for a moment about the biblical story of Adam and Eve, which Kierkegaard discusses in the middle paragraph on page 141. Adam is the character in Genesis, the first human that God creates. The second human is Eve, and Adam and Eve live in the Garden of Eden having a great time, just chilling. And then God tells them, you can roam around the garden as much as you want. You can go anywhere you want, do anything you want, except you cannot eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That is forbidden to you. And Kierkegaard via Vigilius Hafniensis here, which by the way, uh, means watcher of the harbor in Copenhagen, incidentally, gives a reading of this in terms of anxiety by saying that God's prohibition, God's telling Adam and Eve, do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, awakens possibility in Adam. Because Adam hadn't even previously thought it was an option. He hadn't realized that he had freedom to either eat from the tree or not eat from the tree. He was just going about his business, right? Once you receive the message that you should not do something, you kind of have the idea that you could do that thing, right? Once God says, do not eat from this, Adam starts thinking, oh, so you're telling me I shouldn't, but I could. That idea that he could, Kierkegaard describes here as anxiety in the middle of 141. The prohibition induces in him anxiety, for the prohibition awakens in him freedom's possibility. What passed by innocence as the nothing of anxiety has now entered into Adam, and here again it is a nothing, the anxious possibility of being able. Previously, Adam was innocent and ignorant, but now he has this sense of being able. I could do this, or I could not do this. I have choices. This feels really scary, but it's also exciting. Of course, we know how it turns out for Adam and Eve, so maybe they're not great models of how exciting it is. But in any case, a more banal example that I like to think of, which you know doesn't come up in here, is what happens when a professor cancels class. You thought that that block between 11 and 12.15 was going to be occupied by, you know, you sitting in the classroom and doing whatever, like discussing, listening, taking notes, etc. It's going to be taken up by a particular activity. And you're going about your week as if that's definitely going to happen. It doesn't even cross your mind that it's a possibility that you wouldn't have class at that time because it's scheduled and it always happens and you've perhaps already committed to going and so you're not even considering like, should I skip class or not? And then you get an email from the professor saying, I can't make it today. Maybe they're sick, maybe something else came up. And suddenly that block between 11 and 12.15 feels ripe with possibility. Now you, you are free to decide what you want to do during that block. When we feel anxiety and take the leap anyway, we are realizing our identity as spirit. We're being as fully human as we can possibly be. We are making the movement of faith. To go back to something that comes up in the fear and trembling video that I did on faith. Anxiety is not for Kierkegaard a reason to stay stuck. It is instead an invitation to recognize that we are freedom. And even though that feels overwhelming sometimes, it's the condition for the possibility of our own authentic way of being. Now, I mentioned the Adam and Eve story, but I'm not fully putting this in the context of religious faith or Christianity specifically that uh, Kierkegaard suggests um, 
is pretty fundamental to the concept of anxiety here. So for more on that, definitely check out the text. There's always much more than I can canvas here. But I do just very briefly want to mention a really interesting footnote, which I think prefigures some 20th century feminist theory, especially that of Simone de Beauvoir. Kierkegaard says in a footnote on page 133 that anxiety belongs more to woman than to man. And this is in the context of talking about the Adam and Eve story. And so he's thinking about how Eve is, you know, the one who's tempted by the serpent and she's the one who eats the fruit. But he says that anxiety is by no means a sign of imperfection. And so the presence of anxiety in women more than men doesn't signal that they are less perfect than them. If anything, if one is to speak of imperfection, this must be found in something else. Namely, that in anxiety, she moves beyond herself to another human being, to man. I see a lot of Beauvoir in seeking transcendence in the other, specifically in man, in this footnote. So I thought I'd just kind of point it out as, as interesting. Anxiety for Kierkegaard is... He, he calls it the moment. It is this moment that brings together the different elements of time and really concentrates, synthesizes them, but in a way that is also at the same time, nothing. And this simultaneous sort of culmination and nothingness of anxiety, I think is related back to that notion of possibility. For Kierkegaard, ultimately, possibility is higher than actuality. And keep in mind, we're not talking about a delimited set of possibilities, but we're talking about that sheer sense of possibility, that what I called earlier a meta level. And he says on page 154 that whoever is educated by anxiety is educated by possibility. And only he who is educated by possibility is educated according to his infinitude. As a result, possibility is actually heavier. It's the weightiest of all categories. He says it's heavier than actuality because possibility, that notion of anxiety as the moment, relates us to infinity.